It's my pleasure to introduce Tom Donope. I'm sorry, I do not know how to exactly pronounce your name. <laughs> Donahue. 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 Okay, yeah, I would not have guessed that. <laughs> um, and I look forward a lot to this talk. Uh, Tom is a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, just recently graduated his PhD uh, in the cognitive science department at UCSD. Uh, in Bradley Wojtek's lab and he works mostly with uh, neural oscillations and the 1 over f background uh, separation in EEG and a lot of uh, really nice code is available online on git everything is nicely documented and usable which is great and just uh, just to give you an impression, uh, the, the paper about the 1 over f background separation already has over 100 citations. So I, get, I, I would say this is really impressive since it came out this year. Uh, and uh, that's definitely a goal for a PhD. <laughs> so without further ado, I would hand over to you, Tom, um, and I look forward to the talk. Awesome. Thank you for, for having me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come in and sort of just share some, some of the ideas being working on. Uh, the, the paper, it actually only officially came out, uh, but the citations are really for the preprint, which has been out for a couple of years. So it's, um, we're very happy with sort of the adoption um, and these ideas. So uh, I thought what I would do and based on sort of what I understand in this sort of like meeting group is um, I'm doing a like, uh, my idea is to have this sort of like very flexible and open-ended. If anybody wants to ask questions or direct the topics, please, please uh, feel free to do so. And what I've done is sort of chosen a sort of uh, mix and match slash maybe greatest hits, hopefully, of really the methods points that we've been, we've been working on. That's sort of what I understand of the goal here. So uh, some of you might, might have seen some of this stuff before or, uh, or for them paper, but I figured what I would try to do is uh, again, motivating that the, we, we have a series of tools that are available. Um, and uh, you know, why do they exist? What do they do? Why do we think uh, they are valuable things to exist in the world um, in this area of research? So I have a couple slide decks of, uh, here that I'm gonna sort of like uh, go through. And I thought I would start um, here with, uh, it's, it's actually a more recent project, but it's a, in some sense, it's sort of like a background for everything else, which is uh, I started my, my PhD uh, a little while ago now, um, sort of like, as you know, coming from a cog sci cognitive neuroscience background, being like neural oscillations are cool. How do we sort of like figure out how they relate to cognition and you know what they do? And um, you know, then this sort of you know realities hit, which is that actually there's a lot of sort of like uh, quirks and issues and, and ideas, uh, but also sort of just like measurement questions. Um, and just got a little bit distracted, being like, well, how do we make sure we're measuring these things? Uh, you know, really as specifically and accurately as possible. And in sort of that, you know, as these things do in, in sort of graduate school or, or science, you sort of, you start with one idea and you spend a whole lot of time doing something slightly different. And so that's how we ended up with the, the paper that just came out, the parameterizing neural power spectra paper, which proposes a specific thing to do or specific way to do um, this, this measurement where we're really trying to separate out that one over F component um, and th those oscillations. And then a little bit more recently, we've been sort of like working on this, uh, in, in my mind, sort of methodological review, which is basically like, actually lots of people have said lots of um, bits and pieces about recording neural oscillations. This is very complex data. It's no surprise that there's a lot of sort of like quirks and complexities to it. And so we've been collecting, and again, what I'm gonna start with here uh, is very much a methodological review. I'm by no means claiming that these, these points are uh, particularly novel. Many of them have been sort of known for quite a long time. But I think one of the themes and some of the things we've been working on is really just to say that, uh, you know, things that have been noticed, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, some methodological issue, I think in, a, in a, some number of cases, they're sort of like broadly noted in the literature, but there isn't a very practical thing to do about them. And lacking that, um, they don't really get sort of like 
uh, properly addressed in much of the day-to-day -day work that we do. And so I'm going to start with now uh, this methodological review of how I think about topics um, investigating neural oscillations. And it's framed around neural oscillations just because that was our initial and many people's initial feature of interest. Um, but this whole thing is all, all, all about both neural oscillations and aperiodic activity. And then I'll jump over, uh, so this is a little bit background more general, and then I'll jump over to sort of uh, what we propose and what we do about it. Um, and again, any, anything that comes up that people want to talk about, uh, just shout out, say something, send in the chat or whatever, we'll go from there. So, um, you know, context, we want to record neural oscillations. We have some study of interest some tasks of interest from data of interest. What things do I think we might want to think about when we do so? Um, and how I'm going to set this up, and I also I sort of decided to start with this project partly because I think it gives hopefully a sort of like very practical input or sort of overview of how we go about doing a lot of this work right now is uh, I don't know what real data, you know, I don't know the ground truth of real data. I record real data. I've, I, that's where I started. I've done a fair amount of this. Um, but then I, you know, I, you know, I calculate the alpha power. I calculate X, Y, Z. Um, is that an accurate measurement of what's going on in the data? I have no idea because I sort of, I, I, I can't validate that. So we do a lot of this work in methods development, method testing based on simulated data. And that's one of the things we've spent quite a while um, sort of setting up and sorting out is how do we simulate data with some sort of reasonable uh, sort of like a uh, parameter, some sort of reasonable characteristics that we think is approximately statistically similar to ne real neural data, and then we can evaluate tools with it. So these simulations um, are available in one of our tools. Uh, all the simulations we're going to use uh, in this talk, this part, um, which are all time series simulations, are actually part of NeuroDSP, the Neural Digital Signal Processing uh, Toolbox, which is a slightly more general toolbox. Um, than then the, the FOOF tool, which is a very specific, uh, do this. Uh, to be clear, these are not biophysical simulations, not biophysical models. We're basically simulating what, what I think of as sort of descriptive or statistical simulations, which is just to say that um, our, our sort of conception of the data is that, you know, if you record EEG, ECOG, MEG, something like this, uh, there are neural oscillations in the data, at least sometimes. Um, and there's also this, you know, non-oscillatory sort of aperiodic activity. We can simulate those different components. We can simulate lots of different features of oscillations, whether they're bursty, whether they have uh, different properties and so on. And then we can evaluate a whole bunch of tools based on this sort of data. Is it able to appropriately reconstruct the oscillatory components, the aperiodic components? Um, what sort of uh, jeopardies does it have? And I'll come back to our, I'm gonna go through sort of like the problem statements before I, I, I say too, too much about what we recommend or what other people recommend as some of the sort of tools here. Um, but these are in context of our toolkit. Uh, the three main things that that, um, that have been worked on the lab by, by more people than just me, of course. Neural DSP again has our simulation toolkit, which we think is really uh, useful, uh, at least for methods development. And it has a lot of just sort of uh, general digital signal processing tools um, for, for neural data. The spectral parameterization tool, we'll come to what that actually is and does a little bit later, but it's a separate uh, module. And then also I'm going to refer to a little bit in this early talk, although this is, this is not my work, this is um, other people's work, is cycle by cycle analyses. And again, just here zooming out slightly from, from the specific one of ref topic, just to say that, you know, I think there's lots of different things we can think about neural oscillations. And this is another tool that is available from the lab. Each of these three are Python, toolboxes, open source, um, organized, and sort of available to download through Python. I know at least some of you are, are MATLAB based. Um, the FOOF tool, we can come back around to this, does have a MATLAB wrapper. Um, so basically some of these tools you can use directly from MATLAB. Um, if not, we have some sort of examples where you can sort of go a little bit back and forth. So um, if you you might want to try this, you can, you can still do most of the stuff in MATLAB and so on. If anybody, again, practical details, we can definitely talk about later. So um, I'm going to run through a list of seven topics here of things I think we should be thinking about. Uh, again, somewhat review style. And so I'm not going to dwell on them too long, but if anyone wants to talk about any, each, any of them in particular, feel free to call it out. So let's start with number one, which is uh, this one very related to our, um, you know, my main work in the spectral parameterization is just to say that, well, actually, neural oscillations, they're not the entirety of the data. 
but not even always there. I mean, I think we sort of know this, you know, we stare at data and we see alpha bursts come in and out. We know they're, they're there sometimes. Uh, certain oscillations like a theta or a beta, we might think is entirely absent over, you know, a, a segment of data in some particular region or in some particular context. And yet, I think one of the, you know, I think we know this, but one of the things, the jeopardies that we're often still doing is we might take um, some sort of signal of interest and then we have a tendency to sort of filter it or analyze it in this sort of band by band approach, right? So if we're interested in delta and theta and alpha and beta, we might compute a power spectrum and look at the power in each of those frequency windows, or we might filter into each of those frequency ranges. And then we compute measures of interest across those sort of individual frequency ranges of interest within the data. And then we label them based on those, those band ranges. Um, this, this, doing something like this already has a lot of assumptions about the data. And I think those assumptions are not very well met. Um, and the assumption really is that those band ranges specifically reflect uh, oscillatory activity that is definitely present in the signal. And those, those are by no means guaranteed. So in this simulation, again, this is simulated data, but I've simulated um, a one over F distributed signal. There's actually no oscillation in here. Um, the way that we simulate the one over F activity, by the way, if, if you're interested is, there's many ways to do it, but this one is we literally start with white noise and then you can rotate the spec, the power spectrum to match some sort of like one over F distribution. This is one over F to the 1.5 or something like that. Um, and then you get the signal at the top. Um, it looks, I think, you know, broadly plausible. Uh, one thing I think uh, is, often strikes me over this is because there is this sort of, there's a lot of low frequency power. You know, we might, I think if we, sometimes we overinterpret with our eyes to say that, oh, maybe there's some sort of slow rhythm here. And here statistically, I know that that is not true. That's just the pattern that you get when you have something approaching brown noise. Um, and yet if we were to sort of go through and filter or analyze power or so on, um, we might make claims about specific frequencies when uh, really the detail here, the, the thing that's happening in the data is actually a non-frequency specific activity. Um, so this is sort of one of the first big considerations and this we'll come back to because it's one of the main motivators of the special parameterization. Um, but it's one of our sort of baseline uh, ideas. And here the, the goal as we'll come back to is to say that if there is frequency specific activity, we typically see that as a peak over and above the one over F. Um, and that is one way to have evidence that there is sort of an actual oscillation in the signal. Um, and so we can look at that a little bit here, which is to say in this situation, um, I've simu simulated some signals that do have uh, an alpha peak. And these, these power spectra hopefully ag again, look sort of like relatively plausible uh, where you do have that broadly one over F spectrum and then a clear peak of power at a particular frequency range. And this, uh, this situation is a case in which we do have sort of uh, specific rhythmic alpha power. And then as many people have pointed out over you know, the history of a lot of this work is um, even when oscillations are present, they often can vary in their center frequency. And we might often use an alpha power measure of something like eight to 12 Hertz. And that sometimes works well and it sometimes sort of doesn't. Basically sometimes your predefined uh, frequency range might not very well capture the, the sort of like band that's actually occurring in any, any sort of segment of data. So what I'm doing here is two signals that each have an alpha, quote unquote alpha component. One of them is centered at the canonical 10 Hertz. One of them is centered around eight Hertz. So sometimes in sort of, um, you know, different age groups or, ex or different um, clinical conditions, things like this, we do see uh, sort of differences in center frequencies. Um, and in that scenario, uh, if you just apply a predefined frequency range, you might sort of misestimate the power. In this scenario, it looks like these two signals have a frequency difference, uh, sort of a power difference in alpha, but that's only true if you take the sort of canonical band range. It doesn't actually, it's not actually true if you sort of like individualize your frequencies. So this is another, so we're sort of building up things that we would like to do. We would like to make sure there's a clear oscillation present. We would like to make sure we, we measure it sort of wherever in frequency space it occurs. Um, so those are some goals that we might have. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, another thing, and this is sort of like uh, stepping on top of number one, uh, very sort of very, very related to number one, but it's just to say that as well as saying that aperiodic activity is present, I think we've sort of known that for broadly forever. Um, that's not you know, a new observation by any means. Um, I think it's been underappreciated. Partly, we didn't necessarily know what it meant or how to measure it. Um, but partly, I think what is newer is the degree, uh, the understanding to how variable it is. 
And so if one over F activity was sort of broadly considered noise, if it was static, you know, it just, you know, condition A, condition B, one over F is the same, you could sort of ignore it. Any change between condition A and condition B would be reasonably interpreted as oscillatory. That turns out to be also a sort of a faulty assumption, um, which is to say that we quite often see scenarios in which, you know, the one over F can change. And if you're just doing measures where you're looking at, uh, you know, power between some predefined frequency range, that might actually not uh, be specific to that frequency range. Um, and so uh, this might actually be simpler just that, again, these are simulated data and these are, this is in this case, perhaps exaggerated, but if you think, look at the bottom trace here, just to really illustrate the point, I've simulated white noise versus uh, pink noise. So one over F to the zero versus one over F to the one. And in that scenario, of course, we can see the power spectra are quite different. If I wasn't really paying attention to the power spectra and I just filtered between eight to 12 Hertz, you would see that it looks like there's a, there's a big difference in you know, quote unquote alpha power. In this situation, there's no alpha power present um, in this bottom case. And so if, if you're not really careful about separating out those sort of components, you might misinterpret sort of what really is changing. I think one way to think about this is like, it's broadly true that the power at 10 Hertz changed but actually the power at every frequency changed. And so if your interpretation of that change is really about a specific frequency, then that's sort of like a potentially ill-posed um, scenario. Uh, this uh, is all the same if there are peaks, um, which is just to say that there, there can be oscillations present and yet still uh, a measure change in the frequency band doesn't necessarily relate specifically to a change in the oscillatory power. It could still be that there's some sort of global shift across the spectrum. Um, and these are often relatively obvious if you look at the power spectrum, but I think a lot of the analysis that we will tend to do uh, don't have a lot of interrogation of the power spectrum, at least not visually in a way um, that we can sort of like catch these, these different changes. So these three are some of the core um, topics that we're gonna try to address with spectral parameterization and we'll see how that works uh, as well. Um, I'm also for, for this part, just gonna sort of like keep going through some other topics that are not, are not necessarily addressed in the same sort of conclusion, but just say there is this sort of whole battery of topics that we want to sort of keep track of. So another of which is I've are already alluded to, um, but it's just to say that neural oscillations are variable through time. This is another thing I think every, you know, we're all, you know, broadly uh, familiar with this concept, but we don't necessarily always sort of work through the practical implications of this, which is just to say oscillations are often bursty, um, but we're often also applying some sort of like filtered uh, range or some sort of measure from the power spectrum that is collapsed across time or across trials, where if you collapse across trials, it's you know broadly equivalent to collapsing across time. Um, and in that situation, we are often going to interpret a change in the sort of like the measured power as a change in the actual power of the oscillation, basically like it got bigger or smaller. Um, and that is uh, that interpretation is not necessarily well, uh, well grounded in what might be happening in the data. You can see a change in measured power. If you have a change in how many bursts occur, if you have a change in the duration of the bursts, you can also get different changes of the power spectrum if you have something like frequency variation and stuff like this. Again, this is by no means a novel observation. There's actually been quite a lot of really nice papers on this quite recently. Uh, Stephanie Jones has been talking about it. Katarina Zeke has a couple papers um, doing this kind of thing. Um, many people pointing this out, but again, it's this sort of common, common thing that we want to um, keep, keep in mind. Uh, and it, it relates, to, so some of the bicycle tooling, the cycle by cycle tooling that we have in the lab actually addresses this. So I can talk about that if anybody's interested in, in this kind of topic. Um, again, very related to that other those other time domain work is, again, many people, including Scott Cole, who worked with uh, the lab that I worked in, in Brad Wojtek's lab, have pointed out that neural oscillations are often not sinusoidal. And this actually, you know, one of the broader contexts that we can think of is a lot of our methodological issues um, have some relevance or come back down to at some point that the fact that we use things like FFT-based, you know, fast forward transform or Fourier transforms or basically other methods that more or less assume sinusoidal bases, sort of wavelets are most of the time sinusoidal bases. Um, Hilbert's is, is uh, you know, filtered with sort of sinusoidal bases. All of these methods sort of have some assumption about the fundamental, uh, you know, aspect or character of the data that are not necessarily um, valid. Uh, and in fact, we can often see that they're, they're sort of clearly, uh, that assumption is clearly not true, that uh, is neural oscillations are at least some of the time uh, 
definitely not sinusoidal. So in this scenario, again, I've simulated a slightly asymmetric oscillation. Um, it might like look like something that uh, we'd see in, in, for example, in things like the mu rhythm. Um, you know, some some known oscillations are sort of clearly asymmetric, clearly non-sinusoidal uh, more than others. Hippocampal theta in many contexts is often sort of like obviously a asymmetric and so on. Um, and again, we broadly know this, but it's not always cashed out in the methods and sort of these implications, um, which is to say that uh, change in waveform shape can create, or, or, or non-sinusoidal waveform shape can create these harmonics in the power spectrum, which is to say these peaks, you know, a peak in the power spectrum doesn't necessarily uh, mean that there's definitely a specific oscillation at that specific frequency. It could actually, you know, stem from some sort of uh, harmonic character in the, in the data. Um, if you have a change in waveform shape, this will look like a change in power. And so this is one of these examples here where uh, I can change the shape of the alpha in this case that I am simulating. That actually changes the, the, the extent of those beta harmonics. Um, and if you were just sort of uh, simply measuring beta power, you might measure a difference in beta power and sort of interpret a difference in beta power. In this scenario, in that context, this would have nothing to do with beta power. It actually has to, to do with waveform shape of the alpha oscillation. Uh, as many people have pointed out, again, in other papers, this has uh, serious implications for cross-frequency coupling, like waveform, uh, like uh, phase amplitude coupling. That was one of the original uh, observations that uh, Scott Cole has made, other people have made, um, and things like this. I think one of the, the things that, um, has uh, partly as part of this the cycle by cycle approach, which um, it just says to look at individual cycles is actually the degree, the degree to which filtering already is really going to bias your signal if it's asymmetric, which is, um, you know, we talk about phase amplitude coupling having a problem because, you know, you have artificial power in the high frequencies because of perhaps something like harmonics. I think one thing that's me, uh, I, I find underappreciated is the degree to which your phase estimate of the low frequency is not necessarily very good because a phase estimate is based on a narrowband filter typically of a sinusoidal basis. And so you can see a little bit in the, in the sort of situation in the bottom here, you know, that filtered red trace of the black oscillation. If you were to label the peaks of the filtered trace, they don't necessarily line up all that well with the asymmetric oscillation. In fact, if you have a very asymmetric oscillation, you have to start thinking about phase in a slightly different way or perhaps measuring it in a slightly different way. There are things to do about this, um, but they have to be sort of explicitly addressed. A um, couple other points, just because, you know, closing out the uh, lots of things to think about for neural oscillations. Another of which is, uh, you know, especially in a context like EEG, we might measure some, you know, uh, electrode data, and we're really we're we're measuring some very complex, messy uh, combination of lots of different underlying sources. Again, we broadly know this, but I think don't always sort of really logic through the implications in the way that we analyze the data. So in this sort of example, what I've done is I've simulated a data uh, data segment, which again has our typical aperiodic component. And in this scenario, I've simulated this idea that it might have, it might reflect two different alpha oscillations. Um, you know, two nearby sources in the brain might just have a slightly different um, frequency. Uh, this could be, you know, if you're in a sort of parietal electrode, it could actually be something like a, a mixture of occipital alpha and, uh, you know, a sensory motor alpha or sensory motor mu. Um, and if we're not really thinking about this and not really sort of considering source uh, separation, um, the combined signal that we do measure, if we apply measures directly to it, might give us some sort of like a weird, uh, weird answer. And what I mean by that is the the measures applied to the channel level data might not really reflect anything um, about either of the sources in any sort of clear way. Um, so in this scenario, I've simulated two continuous alpha oscillations. They just so happen to have a slightly different frequency. We can see some suggestion in the power spectrum that there might be two peaks, but this can be pretty difficult to sort of figure out based on just looking at the power spectrum. If I then apply instantaneous measures, try to measure the phase or the amplitude of the frequency of the channel level data, what I get is some sort of, it looks very variable, looks somewhat messy. Um, I might say, oh, there's a very dynamic you know, oscillation here. It turns out all those dynamics are actually just an artifact of the mixing of the underlying sources. Again, the underlying sources in this simulated example have no variation. And so uh, again, this is just, you know, many, many people have pointed this out in various different ways, but something that we're not always uh, considering, I think, uh, enough is the degree to which 
um, you know, basically oscillations combine uh, in weird ways because they're sinusoidal, because they're rhythmic, not necessarily sinusoidal. Um, they have lots of sort of constructive and destructive interference. Uh, you know, if you have a phase difference between overlapping sources, they're going to cancel out in sort of like not necessarily obvious ways and so on. And so these kind of things, um, again, a, a little bit indirectly related to something like the power spectrum parameterization, but I think they're uh, always, we should always be thinking of this kind of thing uh, just because it, it's, you know, in basically the theme in many ways is it's easy to apply a measure and misinterpret it if we don't really strongly consider that the thing that we measured could would come from some other change right if we want to assume that it's a change in power or a change in phase or xyz um, you know what are the other explanations that could make the data look like that um, that's sort of the theme of this this whole setup um, and somewhat related to that the last thing that i'm going to do in this sort of intro overview of all of the problems that i can think of um, is to say that uh, measured neural oscillations, many of them are basically dependent on power or another way to phrase this is like, we have, we have a signal to noise ratio um, that we can consider is which is basically like how prominent is the oscillation and are we able to accurately measure things from it? Um, and we would like to be able to measure things that aren't power um, and think that they are independent of power. Um, that turns out practically not to be strictly very easy. So. Um, for example, here, uh, you know, we often do things like phase dynamics or phase coupling and, and, you know, certain studies might do sort of like this massive multivariate sort of like phase coupling between all frequencies or phase coupling between all sources. And then you basically, uh, you're trying to do some sort of, let's say, functional connectivity. And ideally, you would like to do functional connectivity sort of like uh, absence of differences of power, right? We would like to be able to interpret this as something different from power dynamics. The problem is, is that um, base measures that we might take, like instantaneous uh, phase, um, we can only estimate them well in, in sort of the presence of enough power to estimate them. And again, this is by no means a novel observation. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not in it by any means specific to oscillations. It's just an SNR problem that measurements have. But I think it's often underappreciated um, which is, uh, you know, by one example is that, uh, you know, a measured change in phase coupling or a measured change in phase variability, or basically, you know, some, you know, how often does phase reset? We might, we often look at that and we're not very consistently or clearly controlling for changes in power, which is if you have a lower power signal, you have a lot more variability in your measures. And if you interpret that variability as real variability, um, that might be the wrong interpretation. That variability might simply be because there is low power in that signal. Um, and this, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've showed this SNR idea for very sort of simple univariate measures of something like instantaneous phase or instantaneous amplitude. Um, but it relates to basically all the things that we might want to do, right? Detecting a peak in the power spectrum has an SNR component to it. Measuring the waveform shape of an oscillation has an SNR component to it. You can't really sort of elucidate exactly what shape it has if there's not enough power or not enough um, sort of oscillation present to be able to sort of accurately uh, estimate that. And things like burst detection are very related to, to something like SNR because um, you know one way to increase your SNR is to just actually make sure you isolate um, temporal epochs where the oscillation is present which is to say you might do better at something like phase estimation if you make sure you only look at, at times when the oscillation is present. That's basically a way to optimize the, your power of your observation. Um, whereas if, uh, if, you, if you apply this sort of measure across sort of the whole time series, um, you might be isolating, you might be analyzing segments that actually have no oscillation present. And so again, at the end here, uh, hopefully to a certain extent, you see that these are all pretty interrelated. Um, but there's, there's different things to do about them. So this is how um, I've come to think about uh, the things that we need to be doing if we're gonna study neural oscillations um, and or if we're gonna study aperiodic activity, which is basically to say that these, uh, these signals that we record are complex. They have multiple components with multiple different features interacting in all sorts of weird and fuzzy ways. Um, if one is trying to focus on uh, neural oscillations, I think we all, always need to be considering, well, uh, they might be there or not. We need to verify the presence. Um, if they are present, they still might have variable peak frequency. They might have temporal, a variable sort of temporal uh, occurrence, which is basically they might be bursty. Um, they might have variable waveform properties. All of these are potential confounds. They can lead to a misinterpretation, um, which is, in some sense, the... Uh, 
is perhaps the pessimistic viewpoint. I think the perhaps optimistic viewpoint is that I would say all of these are features of interest. Um, you know, several studies have shown like, if, well, if you actually study the waveform shape specifically, it can tell you something very interesting about the underlying circuit. Um, we can interpret that in a useful way. So once these are not just not necessarily simply things to try to do uh, just to get better measures of our old idea of what we should measure, but actually new features of interest. And that's actually, I think, one of the biggest motivating factors for the aperiodic signal. For a very long time, it's been um, largely considered this nuisance variable which is to say it's just something there, it's not the thing of interest and we just have to sort of like average it away. Uh, not only does averaging it away turn out not to work necessarily super well in at least the simplest version, but actually it is this really interesting thing um, that it is itself very variable and lots of ideas that it might be useful and interpretive, um, useful and interpretable and so on. Um, yeah, so that's my, these are all the method problems. Um, I will jump into the next sort of like, what do we do about them and try to address some of these problems, but uh, I've been talking a lot. I want to pause. Oops. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know if there's something in the chat. I was trying to keep an eye on that. Yes. Is that something? There was one question in the chat. Oh, um, uh, or is yeah. this related to Ferranco 2019? Yeah. So Natalie Ferranco is with Brad, Wojtek now. Um, so the 2019 paper, the waveform shape paper was done independently, uh, her own work, uh, very cool stuff. And she now works with Brad Wojtek. Um, so yeah, yes, it is. Um, and again, I, I have not myself been um, somebody working on the waveform shape stuff, um, but uh, it's very cool. So in fact, maybe I'll do a super quick plug for that, because otherwise, I, it's it's not something that I will talk about more. Um, but one of the tools uh, that the lab is uh, develops, um, originally developed by Scott Cole, now something that Natalie uses in some of her work and things like this is I alluded it to this cycle by cycle approach to neural oscillations. And the idea with this tool is basically to say um, that, you know, filtering, uh, sorry, that's not necessarily the, the clear um, division. Uh, basically, assuming a sinusoidal of age is fil filtering and looking at oscillations in that sort of sense, um, doesn't necessarily address the different waveform shapes. Um, it can have a lot of jeopardy between basically, uh, you know, misestimating things like power and phase because of the variable waveform shape. And much more than that as a control analysis, we would like to be able to analyze waveform shapes specifically. So the cycle by cycle toolbox is this idea. Um, and one way I think of our tools is given all these problems that I've, I've laid out here so far is one might have a couple different strategies. What I've worked on primarily is let's still use the frequency domain and let's try to fix it. Um, and that's what I'll talk about in terms of like, you know, how do you, how do you address all these issues in the, fre in the frequency domain while, while still using the frequency domain while still using a sinusoidal basis. And that's really what the spectral parameterization tries to do. Um, as a complement, not a competitor, I think is a complement to something else we should be thinking about is at least some of the time, we should just stop using sinusoids and try something else. And so the cycle by cycle analysis is a time domain approach. So it works directly in the time domain representation of the signals. Um, it does what I could like basically, it's some sense brute force approach, which is to say, well, if we think there's a rhythm there, we can find peaks and troughs. We can find, you know, basically max and mins in the signals. We can label them and basically we can characterize signals as if we find the peak and the trough in the zero crossing, we don't have to assume it's a sinusoid. We can just measure very directly is it an asymmetric you know, sawtooth? Uh, does it have a quicker rise and a short decay or vice versa? We can basically measure all of these different things directly in the time series. And if you do that, uh, I alluded to this, this relates to actually burst detection. Um, there's a whole bunch of sort of stuff in this module where you can basically find those peaks and troughs. And then you can basically figure out if they are real peaks and troughs. And by that, you can label each segment of the data as a cycle or not. And when you collect, basically you combine across cycles, you have a measure of burst detection or a measure of bursting. Basically, if you see a series of cycles, the oscillation is present. Um, 
And if you know, if you can no longer reliably detect cycles in the time domain, that's basically an argument that there is not a reliable oscillation at that in that time window. Um, so this kind of stuff is super related to Schwaronko 2019, other work that Natalie's doing, lots of papers from Scott and so on. This is one of those open source tools. Um, each of these tools has this sort of like documentation website, uh, tutorial, which even if you're not working in Python, um, if you know MATLAB or something similar, uh, these um, I think are, are sort of like fairly interpretable, um, which is to say that they do use code to sort of demonstrate some of the points. Um, but nothing like if you're familiar with signal analysis, nothing should be too, too weird. In this scenario, again, if I showed you before, if we were to filter in sort of canonical way, um, like a narrowband signal, we would sort of basically lose all these shape properties. This is an example where we're doing a, um, a broadband filter. So you're still basically getting rid of some of that high frequency variation, but in a way that you are able to preserve some of these shape characteristics, and then you can measure those. And so here you can basically detect all these cycle points and then measure, you know, how quickly do you go from peak to trough? Is that different from how quickly you go from um, you know, trough to peak and vice versa? And you get these sort of asymmetry measures and, and so on. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my plug for the cycle by cycle stuff, um, which again, not something that I uh, thought up or at any means, I do help maintain this package. Um, but yeah, so any questions, comments, concerns so far? Again, very happy for this to be something of a discussion uh, rather than just me rambling forever. Nope, everything is too easy or too known or too confusing. Let me double check the chat. I would say everything is pretty interesting so far. And uh, cool. from, judging by experience, questions will come afterwards usually. <laughs> More Cool, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I have a little question. Sorry, I'm an intruder here, but you know, I'm enjoying your talk. Uh, when you said, say, if you, if you see changes in the aperiodic uh, signal, so if yep. the changes come from, say, the low frequency side of the spectra, you said that we cannot interpret it as being low frequency, but or we cannot interpret it as a matter of frequency, but we can still say there's something slow happening in the signal, no? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I think one way to think about that, I'll, I'll jump slightly ahead. Uh, what I was, the main thing is think if, if you do find that it's a, it's a specifically a low frequency change, then you could definitely say well, there's a specific low frequency change. Okay. But to say that specifically, you sort of do have to check the other frequencies. So I think one of the, the most problematic scenarios is which if you like look at the delta range, but then don't look at every other range, but interpret it as specific to delta, then you might miss that actually there's also a change in beta or something like this. And so in this scenario, I would be worried about uh, panel D in this slide that I've just pulled up, which is to say that if you measure a specific frequency range, um, what the question that I have is like, well, is it specific to that frequency range? Um, mm -hmm. And if you would basically look across the whole spectrum, in at least some cases, we do see that there's been um, sort of a rotation of the whole spectrum. In that scenario, I wouldn't want to call it, you know, a delta or an alpha specific change. Um, I would say a sort of a more parsimonious explanation would just be say that actually there can be an overall shift in the spectrum. Um, and that is something we do observe and I'll, 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 I can show some examples of that as well. Um, but uh, I think we should think about that very differently, right? The interpretation of what changed in the data is quite different in that scenario. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree that if, um, you know, if you find a specific change, you can call it a specific change um, and it's still, it, it, but uh, we have to check sort of, the, again, check the other thing that might explain that change in the data. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. Um, so in that case, what I'm gonna do, uh, again, feel free to jump in with questions anyway. So far, I've basically laid out uh, a list of complaints uh, about neural oscillations. Um, and uh, these are by no means like things that I've done in my prior work that our lab had done in our prior work. Um, and I haven't really given you any solutions. So to try to be a little bit more optimistic about it, uh, I'm jumping talk to a sort of a different set of talk here. So 
Uh, I'm going to skip through things a little bit as I go through various things because I'm gonna, again focusing a little bit more on the methods um, as, as what I was, was thinking would be um, the interesting thing here. So let me jump ahead, which is uh, sorry. Um, again, this we've basically already talked about, which is to say that periodic activity, we're focusing on, on some sort of rhythmic component of the data. Um, and as I'm sure many people are, you know, basically know, like there's lots of reasons that we're very interested in periodic activity, um, including things like we, you know, we think it might relate to some sort of like information transfer between regions. Uh, it's just, if nothing else, a very salient and sort of like seemingly interesting um, sort of feature in the data. And we'd really like to be able to measure it as accurately as possible. Um, so uh, to recap some, something that I basically already alluded to is when we think about neural field data, um, again, this is also simulated data. I do a lot of simulated. There is some real data at the end of the talk. I, I could show you that this does you know, relate to the real data. I, I didn't just make it up. Um, but here's, I think, sort of a common scenario is we, we have some recording and some of the time it definitely has sort of an oscillation and we can sort of like here I've just sort of like manually burst labels and say look there's, a, there's an oscillation in this this data is really interesting. Um, now I think one thing that we're under appreciating is well what is everything else right so not only so in these blue segments there's periods of data where there is no oscillation and in fact I know that to be true because it's simulated data there's truly no rhythmic component in the blue parts of this data set. Um, and even when there is an oscillation, like it's not the only thing there, right? There's more variation than the sort of strictly alpha um, component. And so to try to sort of like come back and sort of flesh this out in the, in the frequency domain, which again, at this point, I'm now gonna try to sort of uh, rehabilitate the frequency domain um, and just sort of like sort of do something slightly different with it uh, due to what we, we think about the data, which is to say that this periodic activity in this scenario, I've simulated an alpha, has that peak of power in the alpha um, range. Um, and yet everything else in this, every other sort of part of this power spectrum in this scenario is sort of contributed from this aperiodic activity. And this actually gives us sort of like an operational definition of what we actually mean when we talk about oscillations versus non oscillatory activity, which is just to say, you know, there's no big trick here. Periodic activity or neural oscillations, whatever we might want to call them, I just mean activity with a characteristic frequency. And so what do I actually mean by aperiodic activity? I mean, descriptively, I basically just mean activity with no characteristic frequency. So some sort of activity that has power across all frequencies. Um, and there's nothing sort of magical about that. I mean, white noise is such a signal. And in, in this situation, we typically see something, uh, you know, some variance of colored noise, which just means to say that there's a difference in power across different frequencies, but there's no characteristic frequency to it. So it doesn't have frequency, it doesn't have specific power at any particular frequency, it's just a pattern of power across all frequencies. So um, a little bit of actual science rather than just measurement, and this is actually somebody else's work. I'm gonna introduce uh, a simple model slash idea here from Richard Gao, who also works with Brad Voitech. So, I've claimed, uh, as many other people have sort of uh, pointed out, that aperiodic activity is often present in neural data. Um, we haven't always been looking at it very um, specifically or very, like it hasn't been a, a focus of interest, a feature of interest. Uh, to a certain extent, I think, you know, older ideas maybe just thought it was just, you know, noise in some sort of sense, right? We often talk about background noise. Um, and so one of the arguments that we have is not only that we need to measure aperiodic activity because we wanna measure oscillations well, like, you know, it's an important element to just do all of our other measurements appropriately, but we actually do think it is an interesting feature in of itself. So to focus on the aperiodic activity, why might we think that it is physiological? And to sort of show where it might come from, we'll introduce a very simple model that Richard has worked on to say, to basically suggest where it might come from. And so in this situation, uh, we have a population of excitatory cells, we have a population of inhibitory cells, they both synapse into some region of interest that we're recording from, right? This is all simulation. And this is a very simple model. Um, these are just Poisson spiking neurons going into sort of a simulated um, time series. How do we set up the sort of the inputs? Well, once a spike arrives, basically it triggers either an excitatory or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And postsynaptic potentials we know from a lot of sort of like, you know, biophysics work and sort of detailed recordings is they have this sort of like double exponential 
property, where you have this quick rise and then slow decay, and exactly which direction that goes and those time dynamics depends on which kernel you're using. Um, so in this case, this is an AMPA current and a GABA current. Of course, this is two out of many uh, channels that we have in the brain, but there are some pretty you know, common ones. So they're uh, you know, a reasonable place to start, I think. And so how this model works is basically you just simulate this idea where you have sort of Poisson input spiking. Um, the excitatory cells go on to um, excitatory channel dynamics and vice versa for inhibitory. And then you can simulate sort of a power spectrum, oh, sorry, simulate a field potential separated by excitation inhibition. And then you, you assume that the sort of total uh, field is just basically the sum across the different um, excitation inhib inhibition. Um, and why this is interesting is because due to the basically the double exponential shape of these kernels, each of those uh, elements, the excitation in inhibition, has a 1 over f distributed power spectrum. And when you sum them together, you actually expect a 1 over f distributed power spectrum. Um, and so this is basically our baseline explanation, one possible explanation. Why would you expect 1 over f activity in the neural field? Well, at least part of your neural field is coming from uh, sort of spiking into some re region of interest. And that actually predicts that you should see a one over f distributed output. And of course, this is super simplified in this scenario. Like basically you can imagine you might add oscillations on top of this, at least some of those populations of cells might have sort of rhythmic spiking or rhythmic output X, Y, Z that would sort of add other elements. Um, but this is, I think, a sort of a baseline idea as to basically why one over f is interesting that it's there because you can actually think of it as being sort of, it, you know, there's a physiological, putative physiological origin. The other reason it's interesting is that uh, based on how much excitation or versus inhibition is happening at any particular time, or based on the EI balance of the activity of that cell in that time segment, um, you will basically have more or less of this blue or orange signal, and that will change the overall characteristic of that black signal. So we know that EI balance can change. Uh, you know, if you have a burst of excitation over that small time segment, you actually change the dynamics of your, of your circuit. Um, and the prediction is that should change the overall one over F characteristic of the signal. And so not only do we now expect one over F, we expect one over F dynamics, and we have a putative explanation of why that might be interesting. Um, we have a possible sort of inference to, to talk about in terms of like that one over F. Um, and so that again is a theoretical model. I think like I always think of this work in a couple different ways, one of which is physiologically we can motivate why we do think it's interesting. And there's a lot of science to be done about understanding that element of the signal. Um, you don't have to totally buy this particular model to accept, I think descriptively that the one over F is definitely there. And because it's there, we have to sort of address it no matter what in our measurements. Um, and so that's the sort of like the two angles that I take. Um, so to sort of summarize one of uh, neural field data, uh, again, many, many people have said many, many things about both of these, these aspects of the data. We obviously have oscillations. They're very dynamic and variable. Um, we see them all the time, but uh, we have to be, I think, careful about isolating them because there's also this one of our activity that has been descriptively noted a whole bunch of times. Um, it's sort of clearly there. But I think one of the reasons that up until you know, there, and there's other people looking at this recently, but um, it's, there hasn't been, I think one of the big things we've, we've tried to do is to say that this data has both of these components in it. And if you only stare, if you only focus, try to focus on one of them, at least in measurement perspective, you're gonna have some issues because measure, measuring one of these is difficult because of the presence of the other. Whenever you wanna measure an oscillation, it, some of some of the jeopardy is because you can get sort of in trouble if you're not really considering the aperiodic activity. That turns out to work in, in this sort of reverse scenario. Some measures of aperiodic activity can be actually really difficult to apply accurately if you're not really being careful about the presence of the oscillations. And so one of the main sort of um, things that we tried to do is just to put these things together and say, no matter what we're focusing on, we should always be measuring these things together and making sure we're separating out and controlling for each element of them. So that is the motivation for what I'm gonna tell you about in terms of the parameterizing the neural power spectra story. Um, so I already told, this is again, uh, I'm actually just borrowing from my thesis slide. So excuse me if there's sort of other extra stuff. Uh, so I told you a little bit about conceptualizing neural power, neural field data. Uh, as always, there's sort of lots of people involved in this sort of work. Um, and sort of how do we think about this data? Uh, I think 
we, I think one thing that we always have to acknowledge is the degree to which we actually operate with basically Fourier transforms or the equivalent of Fourier transforms. So things like wavelets are, are functionally equivalent to this sort of approach, which is say a sinusoidal basis. And again, as we already talked a little bit about, which is to say that something like a variable waveform shape has some jeopardy if you use a sinusoidal basis. Well, I think you know there's, there's an analogy there to basically the one over effectivity. The one over effectivity is not rhythmic. Um, and yet we apply, we measure it with sort of a, a set of sinusoidal bases. Now, uh, sine waves are really cool because you can represent any time domain signal with them. Um, but I think the, the jeopardy, the step that we sometimes go wrong is interpreting that possibility as evidence of a rhythm, as evidence of an oscillation or so on. And so here's a segment of data and I'm just playing through a Fourier transform. So all I'm doing is you just sweep across the frequencies and you can build a representation of that overall signal by summing across a whole bunch of sine waves. And this is what we're doing all the time, right? Now, uh, I can tell you in this scenario, this is not a rhythmic segment of data. You can sort of tell to a certain extent, right? This is just a, a purely one over F signal. In fact, you'll see that as you look at these dots that are appearing on the bottom right, those are the power values. And you'll see that there's actually no particular pattern to power values. You'll, you get a sense as it comes in that there's basically this one over F trend, right? So there's a pattern to power across all frequencies. One way to see this that's also interesting, I think, is that actually the, the phase distribution is just totally random. So when you have sort of uh, one over F noise, sort of base, again, this is white noise that's been spectrally rotated. Um, so white noise, I think, is, is more obvious that it has random phases in this sort of representation. And so we can represent the signal as a sum of sinusoids, but that doesn't mean that there's any rhythmic, um, there's any true rhythmicity to the signal. It's just a representation. And that's where we have to be a little bit careful about separating out when we're represented as, as a possible combination of sinusoids versus when it's worth interpreting um, the power as actually rhythmic. So to compare it to a different scenario, this is a segment of data when there truly is an oscillation is you know, slightly more obvious that there's this, um, this peak. And so you can sort of see at a certain point, you get this frequency um, that just has systematically higher power that suddenly explains a whole segment of the, of the data. So it's this blue dot um, that you see uh, right about there, right? It just jumps and you, start, you suddenly sort of captured that oscillation. You can see this sort of blue sinusoid here. So this idea here is again, this data is a combination of periodic and aperiodic activity. The aperiodic activity is some sort of just like basically power across all frequencies. And sometimes you get a frequency that stands out as really capturing the data. And that to us is evidence that there is some sort of rhythmic properties to that sort of data. Um, again, so that's just sort of like how we want to think about the methods, what they're doing. And here's where I think one thing, things that sort of like uh, don't properly acknowledge this, this fact is if we have this, uh, this sort of time series of, of data, what do we actually do? Well, I would say a lot of analyses come down to something like a frequency by frequency approach where basically you calculate the FFT and now you have basically a distribution of power values and you just treat each power value as, as, as basically reflecting that frequency. Uh, which is you know, technically true, but it doesn't necessarily acknowledge that some of this power is explained by a pattern across all frequencies. Um, and one way to think about this is that you know, this is a model of the data where your model of the data is some power for every frequency of interest. And it doesn't really acknowledge that there, there might be some relationship between the frequencies. Another thing that we often do, uh, as I already introduced before, is we might just sort of take some uh, set of bands. And in this scenario, we might sort of divide up this power spectrum. And this is a model of the data where we have some set of bands. Now notice these are, I think, pretty common. Like you can definitely think of analyses that use these approaches, um, but they do not in, in the model that, that is applied to the data actually have any conception of a difference between periodic and aperiodic activity. Every frequency or band is just what it is, but it doesn't actually sort of allow for um, basically sort of separating out the kinds of activity in the data, which is, you know, the idea is that there are different kinds of activity in the data. And so what's the jeopardy? We've, I'll, we've already basically talked about this, but um, this is to go back, which is to say that if you do have a power, uh, you know, a power spectrum or, you know, a filter time series that you're analyzing, uh, we often think about this idea, I think. This is, a, you know, a claim. My best guess theory of mind is that when you measure a change in alpha power, this is the idea that there's a change in the amount of alpha oscillation and that the power spectrum would look like this um, 
whether you, whether you calculate it directly from the power spectrum or in some other means. The worry is that uh, if we interpret this, uh, this might, you know, there's other ways to, to measure the same difference. So as we already talked about a little bit, if your frequency is different between subjects or drifts within a subject, your measured power can change. Um, to uh, interpret this as a power change would be um, sort of ill posed. And then uh, this is again another version of those in initial problems I pose. This is sort of number three back there. Is you know that whole spectrum can basically shift up and down, or rotate around. Now in this scenario, again the worrying idea is if you only look at one frequency of interest, uh, you might miss the sort of like the global change um, and misinterpret it as a specific frequency change. Um, and so that's what we want to avoid. Um, so here's the proposal that the spectral parameterization is basically, what's, what's the model that we're going to try to do here? Well, the idea is that um, we have to consider that some of the power across frequencies is explained by this aperiodic component. And basically, in this case, we can, we can sort of draw in this dashed blue line, which says, well, this power is explained by the aperiodic activity. If I see power over and above that, then I can uh, interpret that as a putative oscillation. It's likely stems from an oscillation. Um, and that is the sort of relative power over and above the one over F. That is my evidence of sort of specific oscillatory power. Now the total power in any particular frequency is the combination of both. It's the combination of the power expected under the one over F plus any sort of extra power, quote unquote, that we get from the oscillation. And if I really want to interpret oscillatory power specifically, I basically want to control for this one over F activity. Or if I want to measure aperiodic activity um, specifically, I want to control for those overlying bumps and make sure that they don't impact my one over F measure. Um, and now all of this, I've sort of shown you like this basically, you might misinterpret the amount of power or the change in power. Um, I think even more worryingly is that you can have all these problems without having any oscillation, uh, which is just to say that your one over F can, can basically, your total power could be only one over F. Um, and so you might be wrong about either the amount of power or the presence of power overall. Basically, you, you might be, it's easy to misinterpret if you don't validate the presence of oscillation uh, exactly what is there. So uh, again, that's sort of the problem restated. Um, how are we going to actually measure this? And I've introduced that frequency model, that band model. And so to just sort of like um, specify a little bit more specifically, specify specifically, that's a good word, um, to sort of clarify, you know, what do we, what is the model that we're going to apply to the data in this approach? Uh, we call it the, the, the periodic and aperiodic model. And the idea is that the neural power spectrum is a combination of the aperiodic component and a aperiodic component. Um, or of course, uh, so we can sort of try to like formalize this, the neural power spectrum as, and what is aperiodic? Well, it's some one over F function that is the sort of characteristic of, of the aperiodic, plus a peak function. Um, and of course there can be more than one peak. Um, and so this is uh, to try to go from this sort of conceptual model to something that we can actually sort of like um, write down in math in a way that we can operationalize and apply to the data. This is what we want to do. We want to characterize a neural power spectrum as a combination of some sort of one over F characteristic plus some number of overlying peaks. Um, what does that look like? Well, to sort of like finally show the result, it looks like this, which is this black uh, trace uh, is the power spectrum. The dashed blue line is the fit of the aperiodic. And then the red line is the fit of the overall model. So the red line, when it goes above the dashed blue line, means that there was a peak fit over and above the expectation of the one over F. Now this both, both sort of qualitatively captures the data very well. Um, but actually everything in this model is actually specifically quantified as well. So again, we can sort of write down that, that equation that we did, developed. Each of them is a function of frequency. Um, where our aperiodic, now I've, I've talked about one over F, this is just a version of a one over F function. It might look a bit funky. We actually have, um, so 10 to the B is just the offset, is really just like the Y intercept, it has one over F to the X or chi. That chi value is the uh, sort of one over F parameter basically, it's what we call the aperiodic exponent. And it reflects the sort of overall rotation of the spectrum. There's also a K parameter that reflects the knee. So uh, one thing that I won't focus on too, too much today, but I'm happy to talk more about if you have any questions is just that 
uh, we don't always, or in fact, we often don't see a single one over F. So a single one over F means that it's truly a straight line in log log, um, which is basically it's a truly a scale free property where um, your your basically your power is just explained by the frequency relationship. Um, and that's in a straightforward way. Now that tends to be true over small frequency regions, but if, if you've looked at something like ECOG, if you've plotted a power spectrum between like one and 150 Hertz, if you've plotted it, these are not necessarily obvious in, in semi-log space, but if you plug it in log frequency versus log power, um, you'll often see that there is not a single straight line. Um, in this scenario, actually, I've been simplifying, much of neural data is not simply a periodic, it has a multifractal or multi one over F regime. Um, now it turns out we can we can deal with that. So that knee parameter is a parameter that captures a bend in the one over F. So the, the simple model we have here actually uh, coming from Richard's early work basically says, well, you can have basically a zero exponent below the knee and then a one over F exponent beyond the knee. And now you have two um, sort of like frequency regimes. Uh, you could also imagine slightly different models that have multiple exponents, multiple knees, X, Y, Z. Um, but before we, we you know, fly off the rails over there, basically just to say that there can be bends in the one over F and we can measure those with this approach as well. Now we need an actual, uh, so that's, that's like what we wrote down for math to characterize one over F. We needed the same for the peaks. Um, this, this, you know, is, is, this function is just a Gaussian. Um, there's nothing sort of crazy fancy about what we're fitting the peaks as. We fit them as, as Gaussian peaks over and above the one over F. This is very practical. A Gaussian has nice properties, which is like we, we fit the, the mean, the center frequency of the Gaussian. We fit the, the width or the basically the bandwidth of the peak. Now we fit the power over and above the one over F. These have sort of a nice parameter set that we want. Um, it has some assumptions that are not perfect. Um, Gaussians are of course symmetric. The peaks in the power spectrum are not always symmetric, but in our test, this works well enough. You could, you could switch out this specific function and do something slightly different if you want it. I think the main idea is we want to separate out the peaks from the one over F. Um, Sorry. So uh, Sorry. I- Sorry, Qu quick information. Yeah. Is there a question? Yeah, uh, we are now one hour in. Oh, and... sorry, yeah. According to the plan, this would be now where the discussion starts. I don't want to uh, like rudely uh, cut you off or something right now, but just uh, just as an information. Um, and uh, I, I find it absolutely fascinating and uh, I have no issue in uh, listening uh, longer, um, but we should keep that in mind uh, for the audience. Definitely. So um, what I will propose is I have two more slides on the basically the method. Um, and then, so I'll just, I'll give you a, a hint, uh, basically a quick overview of how we actually fit this. Um, uh, and then that is a great spot, I think, to go from discussion. Uh, Cause everything after that is like examples or demonstrations and I can just show any that people are actually interested in. Um, so, so far we have this thing that we want to do um, and we have actually some functions to fit. Uh, now we basically have like basically a regression problem here, like parameterizing neural power spectra, the FOOF module is just a fancy regression. Um, basically we want to have sort of robust regression where we can measure this blue dashed line without misestimating that line because of the peaks and vice versa again, right? So the difficult part here is that we should actually, basically if you imagine fitting the one over F, you are doing a, a, in some literal sense linear regression, um, but you have a lot of outliers, which are these peaks, but they're not the normal kind of outliers because they're very correlated. It's not some random data point that's just off in some random sort of value. Uh, you basically have these regions of correlated power over and above the one over F. That turns out to make it a little bit annoying to measure practically. And so there's many possible ways that you could go about trying to fit this model. We've tried many of those variants and we ended up with this, um, I think, relatively simple, hopefully somewhat intuitive approach to doing this. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly run you through, you know, what does the code actually do if you run the FOOF model? Well, we have this power spectrum. This is a real power spectrum in the scenario. I finally showed you some real data. Um, and basically we want to take that one over F fit, um, but we know that one over F fit is hard to get really, really good because of the peaks, because these peaks are a special kind of outlier. Well, what we need to do is we need to just get moving. So we actually have sort of like this sort of heuristic fit, which takes a quick fit of the power spectrum. It then actually sort of drops that out and it sort of subsamples 
the the points that are on the lower percent percentile range of the distribution because those points are less likely to be the peaks. And then we basically, long story short, we have a heuristic fit of the one over F, it gets us moving. Now we can subtract that out from this. Now we have our residuals. Once we have a good enough one over F fit, the stuff that is left is either point by point variation because every power spectrum is a little bit noisy or sometimes there's an actual peak. And so now given this sort of uh, residuals distribution, we want to find the peaks. Uh, now note something I, I sort of introduced way back when is like, we actually don't want to presume where the peaks are. We don't want to look for an alpha peak and a theta peak in the particular range. We don't know, we don't want to presume exactly where they are or even if they're present. So this next step is just a peak detection, but it's frequency agnostic. Uh, and all that means is that for that entire frequency range that you put into the model, it's going to go through and it just does a thresholding this procedure. The basic threshold is, is computed as a standard variation of this uh, residuals distribution. Um, you can actually also add an absolute um, uh, uh, threshold, basically say, if, if you want to make sure you detect only peaks of a certain power range, I can't preset that because I don't know the scale of your data. But if you want to in the model, you can preset an absolute power range. Otherwise, it uses this relative threshold based on basically the standard deviation of this distribution, which we find works really well without having to tweak it very much. We go through, we find a peak. We fit that Gaussian, we subtract it out. We can iterate through that process, finding as many peaks as we have evidence that exist. Until we hit, we have some peak detection, which is now no longer above our threshold. This peak is not sort of like considered to be likely to reflect anything over and above the point by point variation of the, 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 the spectrum. So now we have, uh, we've basically found each peak uh, separately. Now we have a multi peak. Um, so candidate set, uh, we can uh, refit that to the data and then remove that from the original data. And now we have a uh, periodic removed spectrum. Now this is our best estimate of the one of ref of the signal. So now we actually refit this. So by the final estimate, um, we have uh, a hopefully slightly better one of our fit than we started with um, having basically isolated the peaks. And now we have two components, D and F, each reflect the periodic and aperiodic components of the power spectrum. We can put those back together um, where we've quantified that one of our we've quantified the details of each peak. And then we can do a final fit and we can assess the goodness of fit. So basically every time we fit this, we can say, well, actually how well does it capture the power spectrum, right? We can measure this in the R squared, the average error, uh, or you can even be more detailed and say, well, you know, which frequencies does it fit well, which frequencies does it fit not well, that can sort of, sort of show if there's any sort of systematic bias and so on. So that is how we get there. And then what we get by the end of it is this. Um, so in this scenario, again, uh, original data, uh, this is a, a labeled version of what I've basically already shown you. But now if instead of saying, well, what is the power at 10 Hertz? I can say, well, something like, did I find a peak in the alpha range? If it's anywhere close to that sort of range. If I did, I know exactly what center frequency it occurs at. If I did, I know exactly the power over and above the one over F. So this is controlled for any one over F dynamics. And I also know the width of that peak, which is something that we've never really measured more before. I mean, we know peaks vary in width. Um, we don't really know why, so it's it's sort of an extra parameter that might be interesting. Um, and then I can look at the exponent uh, and the offset, and if you fit one, also the knee. So this is in this in the model, you can choose whether you fit a knee or not. There's a whole lot of description in the in the tutorials of whether you should try to fit a knee or not, which basically comes down to your frequency range and whether you see a knee or not. Um, but what I really like about this is by the end of it, we now have a specifically quantified uh, parameterization of our data. And now if the hypothesis is that alpha power changes on some task, um, you can actually compare the isolated alpha power between you know, pre and post stimulus or whatever that might be, or you know, between group A and group B. And by comparing alpha power, you're basically you've already controlled for the one over F. Um, but you can also do other things, which is basically say, well, actually, you know, what is the biggest change? Is there a bigger change in the alpha power measure that I have or in the exponent measure that I have? Because these, um, you know, there might be more than one thing going on and you might want to sort of examine um, different elements. So that is the, that is the, that's the tool. Um, so I'm going to stop here because we can do more of a discussion. I'll quickly suggest uh, things that you might want to ask about. Uh, 
Uh, I have another example where I compare band ratio measures, which is basically just um, an example that shows some of these points. It's basically similar ideas that you already have. We have a bunch of data applications. I can show this in some EEG resin state data. I can show what it looks like to apply to task data and or to MEG data where we characterize these sort of things. And uh, one thing somebody, I think Marius had, had mentioned is we do a whole lot of simulations as you probably got a sense of, but we do methods comparisons. So I've compared this to things like ARASA or other ways to estimate the one over F. Um, we have some sort of uh, talking points about that. Um, happy to talk about any of those. I can also go over to the website slash code and show you a little bit there and or the MATLAB wrapper, which is basically a very simple way to call this from MATLAB. So I'll let anybody chime in if they want anything they want to talk about. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the FOOF method. Oh, FOOF, I didn't say it. FOOF stands for fitting oscillations and one over F. It was an original working title as a joke that we had back in the early days, uh, but it was built into the code. So by the time we um, released the code, it just sort of stuck around. So the tool is sort of called FOOF. Um, in the paper, we use slightly different language because now we talk about parametrizing periodic and aperiodic. Um, it's, it's all about the same. Uh, anyway, yeah, so thanks for having me and hanging out and listening for a bit. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this talk. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure there are tons of questions. Uh, Grace uh, already mentioned one in the chat. Um, Grace, you can, uh, you can unmute yourself and just ask away, I would say. Hi, Tom. This was uh, very interesting. Um, I've actually known about the preprint since right when it was preprinted. So, um, but I'm not a Python user, so I haven't spent too much time with this. But my, my question was whether or not you broadband filter your time series data before running it through FOOF, because the figures you showed right at the end only were up to 30 hertz, but presumably you could model the entire spectrum up to the Nyquist. And I presume it probably depends on um, what your questions are, whether or not you filter. Yeah, exactly. Um, great question. Uh, as you sort of uh, guessed, um, the, there's not a single answer. It depends a little bit what you're doing. Um, so I show in the talk and a lot of the early documentation tutorials here, something which in my mind is sort of like the simple relatively simple sort of like uh, EEG MEG approach where you're really dealing with our sort of traditional low frequency bands, which is, you know, theta, uh, you know, delta theta, alpha gamma, alpha beta, maybe low gamma. Um, now, for me, I, I tend to just like not look above sort of about 45 hertz in something like an EEG data set. And in that scenario, uh, I can fit the model between something like three and 40. Um, and I'm usually not filtering other than that because uh, you could, you know, you could high pass, uh, you know, at two hertz, you could low pass at 50 hertz, but uh, from the perspective of the model, it doesn't really care. I mean, it doesn't really know because you've basically subselected your frequency range. Um, so in this scenario, I've often done basically maybe a high pass in pre-processing. If I have like an ICA approach, I might have like a 0.5 or one hertz high pass. You can have totally viable to do that. Um, but usually I don't broad pen filter other than that. Um, it gets a little bit different um, if one is doing, uh, basically, if you have something like ECOG, uh, you might want to look at something like, um, so this is uh, log frequency, but it's, I forget exactly what it is, but this, you know, this up here is about 200 hertz or something like that. Um, in that situation, oh no, sorry, this is 2 to 70. Uh, one, uh, one common question we get is basically, well, what do I do with line noise, which is basically, uh, you know, if I want to fit an ECOG range from, you know, 1 to 150, I then have my uh, line noise peaks. So you can, um, one, of the, one of the slight annoyances is that the, because of the assumption of the model that there's, there's power that respects the 1 over F, if you notch filter it, you actually basically slightly confuse the model um, because basically now you have a dip, which isn't really conceptualized in the neural power spectrum, and the dip is artifactual. Uh, and so what I actually tend to do in that situation is there's actually some utilities here is if you do have a narrow band artifact peak, which is basically the nine, line noise situation, you can just interpolate that frequency region. So you can notch filter it out and then just interpolate out the frequency, the power spectrum. 
Um, other than that, I would say, I, in fact, advise, like the point of this is that we don't want to narrow band filter before we do the, the thing. Like, so even if, in a, if an analysis of interest is about alpha, sometimes people are like, oh, should I, should I you know, filter between like you know, five and 15 um, and like try to really isolate the alpha? And I usually suggest no, because the whole point is, is partly that, I mean, basically the more data we have about the aperiodic, the better aperiodic fit we can get. And then a better aperiodic fit allows us to isolate the alpha better. So although individual um, experiments might be focused on a particular band of interest, I usually suggest to use broadly as wide of a range as you can in that context. And then you can sort of post hoc extract the peaks. So if I am interested in alpha in a particular analysis, I will fit something like this range. I can basically look at my distribution of peaks. So um, in practice, uh, you're probably going to fit more than one spectrum. And so you get these group reports, which is basically in this scenario, I fit 25 power spectra. So imagine it's, you know, OZ from 25 subjects. Uh, I have my, my distribution of aperiodic fits, my distribution of error fits. So I can basically check if each model fit is fitting well. And then I can see my distribution of peaks. So in this situation, we see, well, actually, as expected, there's a whole lot of um, alpha. They're pretty centered around 10 hertz. So once I know this distribution, I can choose a range of interest to extract as my alpha peak. But in that case, it is a data-driven sort of range. Um, that's a slightly long, slightly broader answer than I think the original question, but uh, basically uh, you don't have to broadband filter. Um, Great, thanks. Just uh, quickly chiming in here, I can definitely recommend having a look at Zapline uh, by Alain de Chevigny. Uh, this year, just a very new paper for removing line noise could be useful uh, in this case. Yeah. yeah, I haven't looked at the integration of Zapline and that, but uh, that's it's a great it's a great idea a great tool and um, there's also a few other papers from the Chevigny that are, are very useful in the methods area. Um, Leonardo, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mario, for organizing this talk and thank you all for the great talk. Uh, my question is about what you didn't explain. <laughs> that is the knee when you do, when you have hmm. more than one over f in the spectrum. Because I was digging in, in your toolbox, in the end, when you do this fit, you end with one value for the exponent. But in fact, you have more than one over f. So how, how do you deal with it two exponents? In this? this is my question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So um, right now, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to two things that I think will help answer this question. So right now we fit uh, this, this equation to the one over F. Uh, be, um, and as, as you point out very correctly, it has one knee and one exponent. But once you have a knee, you sort of should have two exponents. And so the current model that's already in FOOF uh, does have two exponents. It just doesn't fit two exponents. The exponent before the knee is assumed to be zero. Now that actually comes from Richard's model. So the Gao 2017 paper, um, which sort of like uh, uh, motivates a lot of this sort of stuff. If you look at this sort of like black trace in this simplified model, this actually is true that the knee uh, is decays to, the exponent before the knee basically decays to zero, you have a knee and then you have some exponent that can vary. And so under that sort of like basic framework, uh, the current knee model fits one knee, fits the post knee exponent, and then basically assumes the pre knee exponent to be zero. Um, and that's motivated again by this model. Okay, now, so the value, I'm sorry, the value of the exponent is just the fit after the knee. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, when you do the knee model. Now that is, I would say, a limited um, model set that we could have. So the way the code is currently set up is you can set an aperiodic mode. Um, and right now uh, we have a fixed, which is a fixed knee, um, so no knee, um, and a single exponent, or the knee model, which is actually a one knee model, 
um, which basically does this. And so what you'll see is like you don't actually you don't have to fit all the way down to like zero hertz. Uh, but uh, if if you were to extend this and plot this, you would notice that this actually this decays to zero. Now this tends to work fairly well for a lot of data, but not all the time, and especially. Uh, it, I think it's very plausible that there could be more than one knee and so on. So we do have a formulation that has that fits both exponents. It took a little while to sort of sort out the good uh, math for that. It's not built into the public release yet, but that's something that we're working on um, just exploring. So it's we have to do some tests because it's not 100% obvious that the fit approach will work, you know, standardly um, with the different aperiodic. Um, and then it's it's not entirely obvious uh, what context we might need that for. Um, like it looks like some data has a non-zero pre-knee exponent, um, but it is also very hard to resolve the very low frequencies. So it's not always clear um, exactly what's going on down there in the, that frequency range. So long story short, totally correct observation. Um, Right now, you can publicly fit the sort of like public version. You can fit the knee plus post knee exponent, um, and if you want to try a multi exponent um, single knee, that'll be there soon, hopefully. And then, in a much longer term situation, you might imagine that there could be more than one knee, more than one exponent, in some sort of like massive multi fractal approach. Uh, I I would sort of get. I mean, in theory, we could just plug that into the approach, but I would sort of guess that might need some updates to exactly how we fit. Um, a lot. This is like we're always like. I think one thing that um, always trying to stick close to the data. So like, uh, I would want to see clear cases that motivate that we should be doing. You know, maybe two knees or or whatever that might be. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mate, I hope I said your name okay. Yeah, that was correct, but I think I think Klaus was first actually. So. Oh, sorry, Klaus. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, I just... <laughs> no worries. So, uh, thank you very much, um, Tom, for um, joining us here for the talk. And impressive work. And it's kind of really exciting and horrifying at the same time to um, we should revisit some of our data, I guess. Um, so, um, part of the questions, or uh, some of the questions I have referred to, like the real data. Um, and one part would be um, now, what do you see in real recorded data with respect to the one over f function and the variation in peaks um, in the alpha range individually? So, and um, I, I think we might encounter new general problems of a huge variation in alpha peaks and um, how do we basically consider which peaks belong to the same function or not? Um, questions like that come up, obviously. Um, but what is your experience if you look at real data with these approaches? Yeah, so um, you're right. So basically, uh, we, can, we can fit all these sort of things. And then we have a whole new set of new problems. So uh, I have a whole, like, so the FOOF paper that's currently out has a couple, maybe I'll start with just, um, yeah, so let me do like a super rapid fire exploration of a couple of the real data demonstrations. I'm oh, sorry, I don't think I have the figure I was thinking of. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so this, to just briefly recap, and this is available in the current paper, is like we fit these peaks and then we start to see like a lot of variation. So in this scenario, um, I, and I separate out, I look at sort of variability of one over F separately from variability of peaks. As long as the method is working, these are sort of like separate components of the model. Um, and so we do, we are able to basically recapitulate things that we might expect to be the case. So for example, in a young versus old group, the center frequency is systematically different between young and old and the adjusted power is different between young and old. Older subjects have lower center frequencies and lower alpha power. Um, they turn out to have about the same bandwidth. Um, we can quantify that and do so like proper comparisons on the right. Uh, on the left, basically, I can also just, I think one thing I like doing with this model is just you can reconstruct the model components and just like have a look what these sort of look like. Um, and this, you know, so like luckily in some sense, you know, like many of our, you know, very common findings, like they're, they're, they, they hold up. And one thing I will point out is that if I compute the effect size of the uh, change in adjusted alpha power, and by adjusted I mean one over f controlled, the effect size um, is much lower 
than if I just do the total power at 10 hertz. So what that means is that there is a change in alpha power, but only some of it is specific to alpha power. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of variability of one over F and this variability is also not just random, but actually system F relates to this group. And in this case, the group is H. And so, um, and this was actually one of the original findings that Brad had, which is basically one over F systematically shifts with age. And this is like super consistent. Every data set that has any amount of age range, I seem to see this effect. And so the exponent is also changing and we can see like very clear changes um, in these parameters between the young and the old group. Um, and in this case, uh, what I have on the left here is again, I've reconstructed the parameters, the aperiodic specific parameters for each, each group. So I can look at these spectra or partial spectra without the, the oscillations. And what I've colored in in pink is only using these aperiodic reconstructions. If you were to do a frequency by frequency t-test, where would you say there's a difference in power? And the argument here is that these are differences in power due to the one over F because I've, I've isolated the one over F. And we get this very common finding, which is uh, you know, uh, a push-pull difference between low and high band power. So you might argue um, that there's a, you know, there's a change in delta power and there's a separate change in beta power. And you know, many papers have said things to this effect. Um, we would sort of try to uh, you know, somewhat uh, reinterpret that, which is to say that, yeah, I mean, in a literal sense, there's a change in those power ranges, but that's explained by a shift in the one over F. So there's a lot of variability in one over F, a lot of variability in uh, peaks. Uh, again, this kind of thing, we now have a whole, like quite a large collect, you know, I think quite a few cases in which we say the variability of one over F is it, truly there, it varies within and between subjects. And it's not just totally random. Um, it does relate to things that we care about, like age, like disease state, like task dynamics and so on. Um, another part of your question was, uh, okay, I can find, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, do you relate that to the um, IE input? If you link that to the model, are you thinking about general changes in inhibitory and excitatory processes? Yeah, um, we totally can. So uh, I think that this, uh, so again, I, I've done a lot of descriptive work and I'm not as heavily involved in the sort of theoretical slash modeling work. Um, but of course they, they, they go back and they, they motivate each other. Um, yeah, so the, the interpretation um, under the EI model would be to say that as you have across age, you basically do have some sort of shift in the sort of state level EI balance of, um, of subjects, sorry, trait level EI balance of subjects. Um, and I think you can, you can sort of logic out this sort of like state versus trait idea. So we do have task-based analyses where you can say basically, if you, you know, put a stimulus that a subject responds to and you measure basically stimulus induced aperiodic changes, you see this sort of like flaring out of the spectrum, um, which is a, a flattening, which is consistent with basically a burst of excitation. So you can imagine that there's sort of within subject um, sort of state dynamics that either track tasks or we see systematic changes between let's say anesthesia and sleep and wake. All of this is sort of consistent with within subject dynamics of uh, what could be plausibly interpreted as EI. And somewhat separately, uh, you can think about a much longer time scale about sort of like trait level um, dynamics between subjects. So that this idea, and this I think is broadly, I'm, I'm no expert in this sort of aging literature, but from my understanding is broadly consistent with this idea sort of like with the sort of like the noisier adult brain or neural noise. Some, sometimes it's referred to as neural noise, which is ideas, um, basically you have an increase in sort of like tonic excitation. Uh, which would be a flattening of the spectrum. So if you basically have, if you have a younger brain has sort of more tonic inhibition is able to sort of like maintain an inhibited state and then uh, sort of apply excitation as needed, then you'll have a steep resting state one over F and it'll basically flatten out as you de deploy excitation if you want to think of it that way. Whereas if this is broadly consistent with an older brain, basically it just has a less sort of like controlled uh, network uh, state, uh, a little bit more sort of like, um, you know, random noise or sort of like aberrant uh, excitation and we'll have sort of a, a resting state status of a flatter spectrum. This is all consistent. Um, uh, I, again, the, the model is, is quite simple. So of course, there's much more going on across the, in the context of, of aging and so on. Um, so just briefly uh, relate to another thing that you sort of mentioned is, 
uh, if I just fit a whole bunch of data, what do the peak distributions look like? Um, uh, this is, uh, so this isn't a part of the current paper, but we're doing like a follow-up, which is basically like really push at a lot of data. So this is two large data sets where I look at on the left histograms is just the all peaks, all subjects collapsed and, you know, pros and cons. Um, there are clear sort of, sort of like peaks in the peak distribution. So like, you know, alpha is pretty, you know, stands out as the most common peak to find. This is not, this is like purely, is there a peak there? Yes or no. There's no sort of like uh, weighting by power or anything like that. If you actually weight by power, it, it becomes more pronounced because alpha is both more commonly present and more, or it has more power. Um, the, so like, you know, our bands broadly make sense. I think you can sort of label this and say, okay, there's like roughly a theta, roughly an alpha, one, maybe two betas and so on. Um, the, at the group level, there is no clear boundaries. Um, so what I have done for some work is basically say, well, at the group level, you can, if you, if you take alpha plus or minus three Hertz, you will by majority capture this sort of like peak of peaks and you can do some sort of group level analyses. There's a totally open question here, which is to say that, well, how do you actually choose band ranges given the measured variability? And I haven't, uh, I mean, I think you could do a lot of clustering type things, but we just haven't really tried, tried that out. I think one thing that I do find interesting is this variability across all peaks is a group level phenomenon. And what I mean by that is on the right side, what I have is each colored trace is a single subject. So each single subject has quite tight peaks. So for example, like if you sort of in this, uh, or like in the MEG trace, you see there's this sort of dark blue peak around just maybe about nine Hertz. So that subject is a whole bunch of alpha peaks and all of their alpha peaks are about nine Hertz. Some other subject has a whole bunch of peaks that are about eight Hertz. Some other subject has a whole bunch of peaks around 13 Hertz. So, when we collapse across subjects, that's when we get this broad spread of peaks at every possible frequency. Any individual subject has a little bit more sort of like uh, tight control over where their peaks occur. And so what I think probably one would want to do is do a peak, det a peak detection of the peak distribution for individual subjects. And then say subject one has alpha peaks 10 plus or minus one Hertz. Subject two has alpha peaks 11 plus or minus one Hertz and so on. Then you might be able to do a smarter group level analysis. Um, that's, a, that's a guess. Uh, I haven't sort of, that, that takes, I think, I think it's reasonably clear what to try with that kind of thing, but it's just, we haven't sort of cashed it out um, yet. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of variability. Um, I can understand why it's it has been easier to sort of just you know apply a band pass filter and roll with it, um, but I think yeah these are interesting questions to pursue. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. So the next question would be from Mate May. Yeah. Uh, just Mate, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. <clears throat> So thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. I actually have two questions now. I try to be very brief. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. One quick interruption. Yeah. Um, so it's now um, in Berlin. It's uh, ten to six. So um, just uh, for clarification, um, this would be the end of our usually collo usual colloquial session. But I feel like there's a lot of interest, and if you have time, Tom. Um, I think it would be great if you continue, but I don't want to like take your time. And uh, yeah, so I just want to, to ask this quickly. If it's yeah, okay, of if you continue. Absolutely fine. So I have at least another, I, I'm, I'm good for a little while longer. Sorry for, um, for talking a bit long, uh, but yeah. Uh, so please don't feel, uh, feel free to leave if, if you're done. Uh, this is the end, I, I, uh, uh, of course, uh, go about your day. But anybody who does have questions, I'm happy to stay online for, for a little bit longer. And remember, this is recorded. So we will also upload it. Uh, I will distribute it also on Twitter. Um, so if you have to leave now, uh, you can come back uh, and watch the questions on, uh, on YouTube then later. That's great. Um, so, so what I was, was wondering about, I don't know if you can hear me because my name is not lighting yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's I hear you, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, one thing is just very br briefly is that uh, you mentioned the EI model. Um, and I was wondering yep. if you think that that holds for surface EEG. So, so would you expect that uh, that uh, balance of uh, excitation inhibition explains 
the steepness of the one over F slope in, in surface EG as well. Because I read the original Gao et al. paper and it seems to work really well for, for ECOG. Uh, but then for EEG, there's a whole bunch of other things that you know, could be going on. It seems like very far removed from that sort of uh, neuronal level dynamics. Yes, that is a great question. So you're totally right. Um, and I think an, an important clarification that uh, is this model is basically, you know, more relevant if you're basically an LFP electrode um, sort of in the middle of a circuit. I mean, if you look at like A, that's sort of like the setup. Um, another thing that's actually sort of important here is uh, we talked a little bit about knees and so on, but um, the specific uh, prediction of this model is that it's, the, it's actually a, the, the relatively high frequency exponent. And I think you, you've probably noticed this maybe in, in Richard's paper, right? Which is actually it's these fluctuations like between, I think it's something like 30 and 70 Hertz, which is most related to the details of this model and so on. Um, so again, uh, I would say as we go further and further away from this model and we start thinking about either bigger, further electrodes with basically more spatial um, combinations and or we just start thinking about more channels, you know, um, and things like that. We just have to be, you know, temper our expectations and be a little bit careful to not overgeneralize. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, so theoretically, I don't have a great sense of how strongly we should believe this, but uh, descriptively or empirically, we do have um, cases where I think uh, this is consistent. Um, so, uh, one of which is just to say that, you know, maybe the most obvious EI dynamic is something like anesthesia, where you can basically, I mean, brute force, but to basically change the EI dynamic, measure the power spectrum and see what happens. Um, there's a couple papers doing that, which basically uh, are consistent in EEG with what you might broadly expect um, with this model. So there's a paper from Colombo et al., a year or two ago, they measure things a little bit differently from us. We've actually reanalyzed that data. Um, and it'll be part of an upcoming publication, um, but basically just shows that in the EEG range, that lower range, three to 30 Hertz, three to 40, whatever you choose around there, if you measure the slope, it moves around with anesthesia and it does so in a way that's broadly interpretable um, in terms of EI balance. And it's not just anesthesia. So they have like propofol versus ketamine, different mechanism of action, what it does with propofol, which is an EI sort of changer. Um, it, it sort of like matches what you might expect with the exponent. Ketamine ends up doing something different because we think it has a different mechanism of action and so on. And so um, uh, there's, there's obviously way more to it than this model. Um, this, the, and Richard would totally agree with that. And he is also doing follow-up work and he has a new paper in 2020 looking at the knee in particular and different elements of that uh, and so on. But uh, I think that we can sort of like still get a rough approximation and say that as far as we can see, this EI idea does uh, fuzzily rate, relate to sort of something like EEG. Um, but we're all like, we're, we're maybe one of the most sort of tentative, I think, uh, adherents of this idea, which is um, we would typically be like, you know, the, the one over F slope can plausibly be interpreted as maybe relating to EI and something like, something like we would say. And sometimes other papers are actually interpreting that a bit more than we might. Um, but yeah, um, I, I forget if there was another part to your question. Uh, no, that, no, not yet. No, so thanks, for, thanks for that answer. I had a completely different question. My original yeah. question was just a quick clarification so that, that um, uh, the FOOF model it basically um, conceptualizes the power spectrum as the sum of, of an aperiodic activity and, and the periodic signal, right? So, so you're thinking of the two as independent. So it's not, they wouldn't, you wouldn't expect, for example, uh, larger peaks for for you know, steeper curves or the other way around, steeper slopes or the other way around. You, you think of them as independent. Did you email us? Yes, <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. About this. Yes. <laughs> so so, yeah. so we, okay. we don't need to take up time with that answer if if, if others are not super interested and have other questions because I already asked. Yeah. You this, so we. Yeah. So we totally got your we got your email. I talked a little bit with Brad. Um, I mean. The simple version, because I will follow up an email or otherwise. Um, the, the the if other people are listening, the question was basically to say that well, um, there's there's some sort of additive model that we have about how these different components add together, and we talk about it um, and sort of like basically imply that they're totally independent, and yet um, in the middle of the the algorithm, it's actually operating in log power space, and that turns out to be a little bit inconsistent. Um, 
you're you're totally correct, Monte, about um, these 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 points. It's something um, we've been playing around with and interpreting. I'd be very curious to follow up with 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 your ideas about this. Uh, basically, um, yeah, there are some quirks that we need to sort of like work through and and figure out a little bit more about exactly how these things might relate to each other. Um, and that does actually start mattering things like whether you measure them in log space or non-log space. Um, and, and basically, you get to some point about the generative model of the of the underlying factors, which we don't know. I mean, I'm sure other people, perhaps you have much better idea of what, what we might expect. Um, it turns out that the current formulation doesn't actually treat them as strictly independent. And that might have some limitations in particular detecting very low power peaks or the way that they might interact with each other. Um, this is something I'll follow up with, with you um, and we can discuss. Uh, as far as other people cool. listening in, as far as I'm aware, um, this is uh, perhaps a limitation if you're really, really worried about pulling out small peaks in the fact that they might be masked by noise um, and that in other contexts, uh, it's perhaps less practically um, related of, of whether you detect a peak and how you detect uh, and so on. And if one wants to basically, you can sort of reverse infer once you find the peaks, you can sort of recompute their relative powers in sort of like a linear combination and then you could go from there if you wanted to. Okay. Um, so yeah. There's, there's uh, uh, plenty of, of follow-ups. And I think we, we tried to sort of like ignore the, or like we don't have strong feelings about the generative process. I don't know enough, you know, biophysically to say any strong claims, but of course, once you've developed the method, it actually assumes one thing or another. So um, I look forward to sort of talking to you a bit more about that. Um, yeah, and we, we'll definitely, we're, we're, you're the emails on the radar and we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Thanks. Thank you. Of course. Um, Gabriel? Uh, yes. Hello. Yep. Hello. Yes. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. I have to check the paper later. Uh, I just wanted to know a bit your opinion. Have you checked data with uh, individual visual cortex with typical induced responses that in vision, it's easy to get the response, uh, an induced reduction in alpha. But, and if you have a good setup, uh, you can get an increase in the gamma. So there's a, a negative correlation between the alpha and the gamma. I would say that the reduction in alpha, the changes in alpha, it's it's the power of that oscillation actually. But, uh, but and you would expect that the increase in gamma would be something like you have a broadband gamma increase uh, when alpha decreases. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm not so sure now. Um, do you think that the there will be uh, no oscillation in the gamma in that in that case in that part of the, the cortex. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I haven't looked. Uh, I think you're totally correct that there's some very interesting data sets or experiments in that sort of domain, um, and I haven't analyzed them specifically. Um, I think, as you basically allude to, like so different oscillation bands or frequency ranges will have perhaps slightly different um, characteristics. And so like alpha, I'm usually not worried about whether alpha is present. It usually is present. And we also know like pretty, like it, I, a, a lot of the cases we do have clear alpha peaks with alpha dynamics of the alpha peak. Like we basically see true changes in alpha power. Um, for another frequency range, like something like, you know, frontal theta in EEG, I think that's more commonly the case that actually the peak is not clearly present. Um, and so we have other analyses where basically in the theta case, I might be more worried about uh, you know, detection uh, and so on. And gamma is a whole thing because um, you know, once you go above 30, 40 Hertz and the, there's, there's a lot of mess, uh, specifics to different methods, um, there's a whole lot of different things going on. Now I totally see cases uh, in some of the data that we've looked at or in some papers at plot power spectra where there's definitely examples of narrowband peaks in relatively high frequency ranges, at least up, you know, around the 40 hertz range, you definitely can. And in some of the induced gamma in visual cortex, uh, you definitely do see uh, clear evidence of a gamma oscillation. Um, now, many in, uh, an, an, an analyses will also look at like very, very broad ranges, like a 40 to 80 Hertz or a 50 to 150 or 50 to 200. And many of the, or you know, the idea of high gamma in, within ECOG, I think a lot of that probably relates to uh, broadband um, responses. And broadband actually itself might have some slightly different characteristics. So um, 
I can show, this is a slightly different context, uh, ignore the left side, but on the right side here, this is just some sort of like example cases where we are looking at ECOG data. And in this scenario, I'm separating out high and low frequency ranges. And it's just to show that you can actually have like different things happening in different scenarios. So these are actually different channels from the same subject. Um, in the low frequency model range, we see on the top left, uh, oscillation changes. This is, I'm looking at the blue and, and orange comparison spectra. In this scenario, top left, low frequency, basically a clear beta bump uh, prior to this motor task. And then at motor initiation, a complete sort of collapse of the beta power. And that seems specific to a beta power. Now, in another case, another channel nearby, it actually, there's much less defined beta peak. And it looks like there's actually a low frequency exponent shift in, in that sort of low frequency range. And that can also be different from what might be happening in this high, high frequency ranges. So in those bottom two power spectra, you can see examples that look like in some cases, maybe like an offset shift. So broadband in the true sense of just like the whole thing goes up, which people like Kai Miller have talked about and, uh, and has, you know, has been documented in certain cases, as well as of at least some cases, a rotation of that frequency of that exponent across that particular range. Um, and so uh, basically in the high frequency, range, I think there's sometimes peaks, there's sometimes uh, broadband effects, and the broadband effects themselves might have slightly different um, sort of uh, properties or things that they look like. Now, to what extent that's meaningful, um, you know, should we interpret them differently? If it's an offset shift versus an exponent shift, I think probably, I mean, the models would suggest that we should, but um, the, you know, cashing that out and showing that is actually both theoretically well-founded and practically useful is, you know, on the to-do list, basically. Um, so yeah, uh, again, I have a tendency, I think, so slightly like long-winded answers that sort of uh, go around different ideas. Oh, that's but, fine, uh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, where's the chat gone? So if there are no other questions, I do have a question or a I Thanks. have so many questions. I will definitely write you a follow-up email. <laughs> yeah. Anybody, please feel free to email me. Um, you can contact me through email. Uh, if you, is, I can put it in the chat, but it's also um, on my website if you need to find it. But yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Mines. Um, yeah. So let me let me let me pick one. <laughs> that that, uh, that one. yeah. So um, two things. First of all. Just, uh, just what you what you mentioned right now. You told us to ignore the left side. The left side looked very, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to uh, to, to uh, know more about that. And then, um, what I already asked you um, before uh, before we talked here, um, the difference between the FOOF and bicycle approach to Irasa uh, would be also mm -hmm. very interesting to me. Yes, cool. So I'll do a quick um, so. The left side here, um, so this is a sort of tangent to a lot of the work, but so like as I alluded to, we have lots of basic, like our motif has been, let's poke at some methods, uh, let's try to get them working as well as we can in simulation, and then apply them to a lot of data sets and sort of see what happens in different contexts. And uh, we are typically using open available data sets for this because we just have lots of sort of questions we can recycle on existing data sets. And so one thing that I didn't really address in anything previously is I talked about periodic activity, I talked about aperiodic activity. I didn't really uh, like talk about transients, which is basically it, the way that I frame it in the power spectrum is like, you know, oscillations are ongoing and this aperiodic activity itself is also ongoing. And of course there are transient effects events in the data. Um, including things like uh, you know, ERP potentials in like in EEG domain or um, you know, K-complex and stuff like that we see happen all over the brain. And so this question, this thing at the left here is sort of an early analysis where we're basically trying to say, well, how does aperiodic activity relate to something like ERPs? And long story short, we're still sort of digging through this data set, a couple other data sets to try to sort of like figure this out a little bit better. Um, but it looks to us, so what we're doing in this, so uh, in this scenario, I'm measuring pre-stimulus aperiodic activity, fitting it with a power spectrum model, and seeing if that relates to post-stimulus ERP. So there are there's the there computer in different data segments because if I just if I take the data segment with the ERP inside it, I don't necessarily know how to separate out if there's a way to separate like the ERP itself from 
you know, post stimulus uh, apriotic and so on. So in this scenario, basically, I'm just seeing like, and this actually started based on the, the analogy, like there's a lot of work saying, you know, does pre-stimulus phase predict post-stimulus ERP in the oscillation domain? This to me is sort of somewhat analogous. Does aperiodic activity pre-stimulus predict your, your post-stimulus uh, ERP? And uh, basically, yeah, <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, we actually sort of thought it might be more of an exponent effect, um, that your exponent uh, might relate to you know, your post stimulus ERP burst. And that does turn out to be the case. And so you can see this in um, the uh, top panel, uh, basically where if we color each trial by the pre stimulus exponent, uh, you do see that basically there's a sy systematic relationship to the post stimulus ERP magnitude um, of the P3 at least. And this is where like, there's no trial, like there's no, all of these trials are the same kind of trial. They're all just a visual oddball task. We're all taking basically all of the, um, all trials without doing it. So this is not a, this basically like how much variance can we explain without reference to the task? We're gonna hold the task constant, take every, tri every, every trial, the same kind of trial, and then say, can we explain some variance based on the basically the, year, the aperiodic properties of the subject? Um, and that basically we do find a correlation between the two. What that means, slightly unclear. Another somewhat surprising element is um, that actually the offset, so that global offset, um, that seems to predict uh, more consistently uh, than the uh, aperiodic exponent. So uh, as you could probably tell, like I don't have any like super clean, good explanation of this, this, this stuff yet. Um, this is just like, let's look, at, let's look at the relationship between different parameters in our data and see if we can understand something about how they relate to each other and then the next step will be trying to understand what that might mean. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, I don't know if there are any sp specific questions on that. This, this is also really interesting because it, uh, it kind of relates to, um, to that excitato excitability idea, right? So, so yeah. it's, 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 it's going in, the, in a similar direction. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that was part of the sort of hypothesis. I mean, that's definitely why we ex expected it would be more related to exponent. And I mean, and again, it is related to exponent, but this idea that if you're in a more excitable state, you would imagine it sort of seems, you know, reasonable that you would sort of be able to launch a, a bigger ERP. Um, and so that, that correlation between exponent magnitude and post and ERP um, seems sort of like very plausible. Um, so that does work. Um, the fact that it seems a little bit more related to the overall offset um, is perhaps less obvious, but we have to do, there's, there's much more to sort of like check and, and explore with that case. Um, so yeah, anyway, the, you know, the quick version is we are exploring the relationship between aperiodic activity and ERPs. And I hope to have a bit more to say about that one day. Um, to compare to Arasa, um, so there's a whole, this is in the FOOF paper. So there's actually a whole, there's a supplemental modeling note where we more, we basically systematically talk about the differences between these approaches. And um, long story short is ARASA uh, has some stronger assumptions about certain things. And in those scenarios, um, we do better. Uh, but basically, ARASA assumes scale-free activity in a sort of true sense, which means it doesn't actually deal very well with the knee because the knee is a violation of true scale-free properties. Now, because we're parameterizing the spectrum, we don't actually have to assume true scale-free properties because we can fit the knee. Um, and so this uh, is basically comparing the errors of measuring the aperiodic exponent between FOOF and ARASA on a whole bunch of simulated data. Um, and oh, sorry, uh, the top column is something else. The top column is what is done in a method called BOSC, which they just do a linear fit. So we're better than a linear fit, it's good news for us, um, but it's a slightly different topic than that we're talking about right here. So if you look at D to F, these are the quantitative comparisons. So if I simulate um, fixed exponent, so no knee, one peak, these methods are strictly um, equivalent. Uh, 
there's no better or worse. There's no difference in the error distribution for the aperiodic exponent if you just have something like a, a, a low frequency range. This is like three to 30. I simulate one peak sampled sort of randomly across that. In that scenario, they both work really well. Now, as you start adding more and more peaks, Arasa starts having more trouble. Uh, because it's trying to sample out these peaks, but if you have increasing numbers of them, basically it's harder to do so. Uh, and so we start to have a benefit if you do have basically more concurrent oscillations, uh, which is E. And then the real difference is like in F, basically uh, if you have a high range and multiple peaks, and this is, this is a scenario where we have a knee, um, we start doing better error. And the other thing that you actually can't see from this plot is like not only are we at better on average, but Arasa has a systematic bias. So our errors in F are, are centered around zero. We, we, you know, just as likely to slightly over or slightly underestimate the exponent. Whereas Arasa, because it doesn't deal with the knee very well, has a, um, basically a consistent bias in direction. So it has more error overall and a bias in direction. Now this is basically the case in, in the knee situation. So it, it doesn't relate to every possible application, but in the case of having a knee, it becomes very important. And we can we have an example situation of this across that bottom row, which is in, this is a this bottom row is a real piece of data, um, just to make sure that we're not like, you know, dealing with some weird simulated edge case. This is a rat hippocampus data uh, set. I take a, a trace of data with a strong theta peak. You can see that blue sp spectrum is a strong theta peak. It has sort of a harmonic or something uh, slightly above it. If I just use standard ERASA in G, um, it's those peaks are so big, it has trouble. And so in G, we see that default settings for ERASA don't separate the peaks very well, and that creates some error. That's analogous to sort of like the E case. Now I can just resample more. Arasa has an amount of resampling that you do. Now, if I keep resampling in H, you actually are able to get away from, get rid of these peaks. But in this situation where you do have a knee, um, you can see that it actually starts really biasing the high frequency range. And so especially at the, the higher range in H, you can see that the uh, resampled spectrum, the aperiodic spectrum as computed from Arasa, really goes wrong at those high frequencies. And then if you apply an exponent measure to that, it goes wrong, which is basically, and you can see why you would actually like underestimate the exponent. That's why there's the bias there. It's not just sort of like a noisy estimate. It's going to systematically estimate a flatter exponent than is the true case if there's a knee and you've resampled with the, with the knee. By comparison in I, uh, this is what the foo fits to that same data, which is basically we're able to find those peaks, subtract them out, and then uh, we are able to sort of like acknowledge the knee. So we don't actually systematically bias our, our measure uh, in terms of the knee. So long story short, ERASA is good for sh like uh, fixed frequency ranges, like short frequency ranges, no knee. Um, it gets a little bit harder if you have a lot of peaks and it doesn't particularly deal with the, um, the knee very well. So in that situation, um, we the base of the FOOF method does do better. There's a, there's a bit more discussion in the paper in the modeling note because um, I actually just think of ERASA as, a, as a, a different kind of thing. ERASA is a decomposition technique. It basically separates out these different components in the time, well, it returns to you time domain versions if you want them, um, or is applied to the time domain. Um, and uh, that I think is just like a different thing that we're trying to do than FOOF. Um, and so ERASA itself, I, it's, I think is a really, really clever method to pull apart fractal from non-fractal time series that applies to certain um, context within neuroscience. It also doesn't itself actually parameterize the data. Like you can basically add a parameterization step at the end of ERASA at the end of the decomposition. So I just honestly think of them as sort of slightly different techniques with different purposes. Um, and I really like ERASA for certain contexts, but it doesn't generalize as much. I think would be our, you know, obviously I'm biased, but that's our pitch. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. This is definitely, uh, this is definitely helpful. I, I had a quick look at Irasa um, because uh, Julian uh, was also uh, speaking in our colloquial talks last semester. Yeah. And uh, what I really liked about it was that it, um, it gives you um, also time points where there are oscillations present. So you, can, you have an additional um, result uh, in the end where you can know at which uh, points there are oscillations and how many of them and so on. So it's kind of a mix between the bicycle and 
and the foof uh, tools, but it's definitely different. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah, uh, so there's two, there are so many tools uh, and, uh, and yeah, if yeah. you're stuck to doing ERP research, <laughs> there, it's really hard to, to, um, to single out the, the, the next method that you should look at. Yeah, so Julian's work, Julian Casiesa, uh, I don't know if I'm saying his last name correctly. Julian's work is really, really cool. Um, I think one thing I just clarify is his method, the EBOS that he has a paper on, the single trial characterization, that method which does tells you which segments have the oscillation in, um, that is different from a RASA. Uh, so oh, EBOS um, doesn't use a RASA. It uses something else. All right. I'm going to have to um, see that again. <laughs> Yeah, so ERASA is this, uh, you know, spectral uh, irregular resampling, which has this uh, assumption about the fractal nature of the of the of the data. Um, it's described in this paper by Wen and Liu in twenty sixteen or so. Um, really, really interesting paper. Um, the uh, Julian's new method, EBOSC, is like a combination of burst detection with one over f um, controls. Um, that is great if you want a time domain measure. Um, we, I've actually sort of, uh, Brad was, my advisor was on Julian's committee. So we're all sort of like familiar with each other's places. I think Eros, uh, sorry, EBOSC, Julian's new method is really, really great. I think it could be, you could actually add foof to his method and you'd actually get a slightly better one over F fit would be you know, my argument. And I don't think he would actually disagree about that. Um, and so you could use them together because he, he does time domain stuff that I can't do with foof, with normal foof. So um, the Casiesa 2020 paper on single trial characterization, also a really great paper um, for this sort of methods work um, and uh, solve some slightly different problems. And referring back to how I started this talk with sort of that method summary, uh, that'll be a preprint soon, which both summarizes all of the problems, but also we try to summarize a lot of the methods. So I'm hoping that'll, that'll sort of like help navigate the area because there are quite a lot of methods that um, address various of these things in various ways. And it's not necessarily obvious, you know, what to focus on or what to choose. And so we are, we're trying to do more explicit comparisons between these methods and trying to do some more summary writing about them. So uh, uh, I hope to be able to offer um, some sort of a map uh, and not just about our stuff. I mean, uh, Julian's stuff is really great. Aras is really interesting. There's other things that do, do these ideas uh, in various ways. Like, honestly, I think we need to care about both periodic and aperiodic activity. I think we, we can't ignore one or the other. And if you deal, do that, there's, there's several ways that you can do that. It, foof is one of them. It doesn't have to be foof. Um, you know, other methods, to start to address this. Um, but uh, this, was, this was one of the ways that we thought might be a very useful way to do so. Great, yeah. So thank you very, very much again. I think um, it is, it is uh, a, a good point to, uh, to stop the talk right now. Um, unless there are more questions, I haven't seen any in the chat um, anymore. So I think this is, this. I will have to do much more reading and uh, I, chances are very high that, um, that uh, there will be more citations also from my side added to your, <laughs> to your list. <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating and I love um, uh, looking at methods, uh, especially if you're looking into the mobile brain body imaging context and the signal to noise ratio is much uh, worse than C dot EEG and so on. So I, I'm always uh, keen on checking what can work and what can work maybe better uh, than, than other classical methods and so on. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, please, uh, everybody feel free to email me if you have anything. I'd be very curious about like BCI contexts and applications. I don't, I don't know anything super detailed about that, but I think there's um, probably some applications there. Uh, I would just reiterate, all these tools are openly available, open source. There's pretty good documentation websites. This is a good place to explore. Um, and most of the, many of them are usable from MATLAB or hopefully there's some utilities to sort of integrate them in. Uh, please feel free to either open issues on GitHub or email me if you wanna try them out. And yeah, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Um, always nice to have, be able to just share these ideas and, and, and hear questions and comments. So yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. And uh, then goodbye, see you in the next.
colloquial talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye. <laughs>